This is your reader, Terry Bybo Knight. We're on Chapter 5 of C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle. It's called How Help Came to the King. But his misery did not last long. Almost at once, there came a bump, and then a second bump, and two children were standing before him. The wood in front of him had been quite empty a second before, and he knew they had not come from behind his tree, for he would have heard them. They had, in fact, simply appeared from nowhere. He saw at a glance that they were wearing the same queer, dingy sort of clothes as the people in his dream, and he saw at a second glance that they were the youngest boy and girl out of that party of seven. Gosh, said the boy, that took one's breath away. I thought, hurry up and get him untied, said the girl. We can talk afterwards. Then she added, turning to Tyrion, I'm sorry we've been so long. We came the moment we could. While she was speaking, the boy had produced a knife from his pocket and was quickly cutting the king's bonds. Too quickly, in fact, for the king was so stiff and numb that when the last cord was cut, he fell forward on his hands and knees. He couldn't get up again till he had brought some life back into his legs by a good rubbing. I say, said the girl, it was you, wasn't it, who appeared to us that night when we were all at supper, nearly a week ago? A week, fair maid, said Tyrion. My dream led me into your world scarce ten ten minutes since. It's the usual muddle about times, Pole, said the boy. I remember now, said Tyrion. That too comes in all the old tales. The time of your strange land is different from ours. But if we speak of time, tis time to be gone from here, for my enemies are close at hand. Will you come with me? Of course, said the girl. It's you we've come to help. Tyrion got to his feet and led them rapidly downhill, southward and away from the stable. He knew well where he meant to go, but his first aim was to get to rocky places where they would leave no trail, and his second to cross some water so that they would leave no scent. This took them about an hour's scrambling and waiting, and while that was going on, nobody had any breath to talk. But even so, Tyrion kept on stealing glances at his companions. The wonder of walking beside the creatures from another world made him feel a little dizzy but it also made all the old stories seem far more real than they had ever seen before. Anything might happen now. Now, said Tyrion, as they came to the head of a little valley, which ran down before them among young birch trees, we are out of danger of those villains for a space and may walk more easily. The sun had risen, dew drops were twinkling on every branch, and birds were singing. What about some grub? I mean, for you, sir, we two have had our breakfast, said the boy. Tyrion wondered very much what he meant by grub, but when the boy opened a bulgy satchel with which he was carrying and pulled out a rather greasy and squashy packet, he understood. He was ravenously hungry, though he hadn't thought about it till that moment. There were two hard-boiled egg sandwiches and two cheese sandwiches and two with some kind of paste in them. If he hadn't been so hungry, he wouldn't have thought much of the paste, for that's the sort of food nobody eats in Narnia. By the time he had eaten all six sandwiches, they came to the bottom of the valley, and there they found a moss cliff with a little fountain bubbling out of it. All three stopped and drank and splashed their hot faces. And now, said the girl, as she tossed her wet hair back from her forehead, aren't you going to tell us who you are and why you were tied up and what it's all about? With a good will, damsel, said Tyrion, but we must keep on the march. So while they went on walking, he told them who he was and all the things that had happened to him. And now, he said at the end, I am going to a certain tower, one of three that were built in my grandsire's time to guard lantern waste against certain perilous outlaws who dwelled there in his day. By Aslan's goodwill, I was not robbed of my keys. In that tower, we shall find store of weapons and mail and some victuals also, though no better than dry biscuit. There also we can lie safe while we make our plans. And now, prithee, tell me who you two are and all your story. I'm Eustace Scrub, and this is Jill Pole, said the boy, and we were here once before, ages and ages ago, more than a year ago by our time, and there was a chap called Prince Rillian, and they were keeping this chap underground, and Puddleglum put his foot in... Ha! cried Tyrion. Are you then that Eustace and that Jill who rescued King Rillian from his long enchantment? Yes, that's us, said Jill. So he's King Rillian now, is he? Oh, well, of course he would be. I forgot. Nay, said Tyrion, I am the seventh in descent from him. He has been dead over two hundred years. Jill made a face. Ugh, she said. That's the horrid part about coming back to Narnia. But Eustace went on. Well, now you know who we are, sire, he said. And it was like this. 
The professor and Aunt Polly had got us all friends of Narnia together. I know not these names, Eustace, said Tyrion. They're the two who came into Narnia at the very beginning, the day all the animals learned to talk. By the lion's mane, cried Tyrion. Those two? The Lord Diggory and the Lady Polly? From the dawn of the world, and still alive in your place? The wonder and the glory of it. But tell me, tell me. She isn't really our aunt, you know, said Eustace. She's Miss Plummer, but we call her Aunt Polly. Well, those two got us all together, partly just for fun, so that we could all have a good job out in Narnia, for, of course, there's no one else we can ever talk to about things like that, but partly because the professor had a feeling that we were somehow wanted over here. Well, then, you came in like a ghost or goodness knows what, and nearly frightened the lives out of us and vanished without saying a word. After that, we knew for certain that something was up. The next question was how to get here. You can't go just by wanting to. So we talked and talked, and at last the professor said the only way would be by the magic rings. It was by those rings that he and Aunt Polly got here long, long ago when they were only children, years before we younger ones were born. But the rings had all been buried in the garden of a house in London. That's our big town, sire. And the house had been sold. So then the problem was how to get at them. You'll never guess what we did in the end. Peter and Edmund, that's the High King Peter, the one who spoke to you, went up to London to get into the garden from the back early in the morning before people were up. They were dressed like workmen so that if anyone did see them, it would look as if they'd come to do something about the drains. I wish I'd been with them. It must have been glorious fun. And then they must have succeeded, for the next day Peter sent us a wire. That's a sort of a message, sire. I'll explain about it some other time. To say he'd got the rings. And the day after that was the day Pole and I had to go back to school. We're the only two who are still at school, and we're at the same one. So Peter and Edmund were to meet us at a place on the way down to school and hand over the rings. It had to be us two who were to go to Narnia, you see, because the older ones couldn't come again. So we got into the train. That's the kind of thing people travel in in our world. A lot of wagons chained together. And the professor and Aunt Polly and Lucy came with us. We wanted to keep together as long as we could. Well, there we were in the train, and we were just getting to the station where the others were to meet us, and I was looking out of the window to see if I could see them, when suddenly there came a most frightful jerk and a noise. There we were in Narnia, and there was your majesty tied up to the tree. So you never used the rings, said Tyrion? No, said Eustace, never even saw them. Aslan did it all for us in his own way, without any rings. But the High King Peter has them, said Tyrion. Yes, said Jill, but we don't think he can use them. When the other two Pavenzies, King Edmund and Queen Lucy, were last here, Aslan said they would never come to Narnia again, and he said something of the same sort to the High King only longer ago. You may be sure he'd come like a shot if he's allowed. Gosh, said Eustace, it's getting hot in this sun. Are we nearly there, sire? Look, said Tyrion, and pointed. Not many yards away, gray battlements rose above the treetops, and after a minute's more walking, they came out in an open, grassy space. A stream ran across it, and on the far side of the stream stood a squat, square tower with very few and narrow windows and one heavy-looking door in the wall that faced them. Tyrion looked sharply this way and that to make sure no enemies were in sight. Then he walked up to the tower and stood still for a moment, fishing up a bunch of keys which he wore inside his hunting dress on a narrow silver chain that went round his neck. It was a nice bunch of keys that he brought out, for two were golden and many were richly ornamented. You could see at once that they were keys made for opening solemn and secret rooms in palaces or kes caskets and chests of sweet-smelling wood that contained royal treasures. But the key which he now put into the lock of the door was big and plain and more rudely made. The lock was stiff. For a moment, Tyrion was afraid he would not be able to turn it, but at last he did, and the door swung open with a sullen creak. Welcome, friends, said Tyrion. I fear this is the best palace the king of Narnia can now offer to his guests. Tyrion was pleased to see that the two strangers had been well brought up. They both said not to mention it and that they were sure it would be very nice. As a matter of fact, it was not particularly nice. It was rather dark and smelled very damp. There was only one room in it, and this room went right up to the stone roof. A wooden staircase in one corner led up to a trap door by which you could get out on the battlements. There were a few rude bunks to sleep in and a great many lockers and bundles. There was also a hearth which looked as if nobody had lit a fire in it for a great many years. We'd better go out and gather some firewood first thing, hadn't we? said Jill. 
Not yet, said Tyrion. He was determined they should not be caught unarmed, and began searching the lockers, thankfully remembering that he had always been careful to have these garrison towers inspected once a year to make sure they were stocked with all things needful. The bowstrings were there in their coverings of oiled silk. The swords and spears were greased against rust, and the armor was kept bright in its wrappings. But there was something even better. Look, said Tyrion, as he drew out a long male shirt of a curious pattern and flashed it before the children's eyes. That's funny-looking male, sire, said Eustace. Ah, that, said Tyrion. No dwar Narnian dwarf smithied that. Tis male of Callerman, outlandish gear. I have ever kept a few suits of it in readiness, for I never knew when I or my friends might have reason to walk unseen in the Tisrock's land. And look on this stone bottle. In this there is a juice which, when we have rubbed it on our hands and faces, will make us brown as calamines. Oh, hooray, said Jill. Disguises. I love disguises. Tyrion showed them how to pour out a little of the juice onto the palms of their hands and then rub it well over their faces and necks, right down to the shoulders, and then on their hands right up to the elbows. He did the same himself. After this has hardened on us, he said, we may wash in water and it will not change. Nothing but oil and ashes will make us white Narnians again. And now, sweet Jill, let us go see how this male shirt becomes you. Tis something too long, yet not so much as I feared. Doubtless it belonged to a page in the train of one of their Tarkans. After the male shirts, they put on calamine helmets, which are little round ones, fitting tight to the head and having a spike on top. Then Tyrion took long rolls of some white stuff out of the locker and wound them over the helmets until they became turbans, but the little steel spike still stuck up in the middle. He and Eustace took curved calamine swords and little round shields. There was no sword light enough for Jill, but he gave her a long straight hunting knife which might do for a sword at a pinch. Hast any skill with the bow, maiden? said Tyrion. Nothing worth talking of, said Jill, blushing. Scrub's not bad. Don't you believe her, sire, said Eustace. We've both been practicing archery ever since we got back from Narnia last time, and she's about as good as I now. Not that either of us is much. Then Tyrion gave Jill a bow and a quiver full of arrows. The next business was to light a fire, for inside that tower it still felt more like a cave than like anything indoors, and set one shivering. They got warm, gathering the wood, the sun was now at its highest, and when once the blaze was roaring up the chimney, the place began to look cheerful. Dinner was, however, a dull meal, for the best they could do was to pound up some of the hard biscuit which they found in a locker and pour it into boiling water with salt, so as to make a kind of porridge. And there was nothing to drink but water. Oh, I wish we'd brought a packet of tea, said Jill. A tin of cocoa, said Eustace. A firkin of so or good wine in each of these towers would not have been amiss, said Tyrion. And that is the end of chapter five. We're on chapter six. It's called A Good Night's Work. About four hours later, Tyrion flung himself into one of the bunks to snatch a little sleep. The two children were already snoring. He had made them go to bed because he knew they would have to be up most of the night, and he knew that at their age they couldn't do without sleep. Also, he had tired them out. First, he'd given Jill some practice in archery and found that, though not up to Narnian standards, she was really not too bad. Indeed, she had succeeded in shooting a rabbit, not a talking rabbit, of course. There are lots of the ordinary kind about in western Narnia, and it was already skinned, cleaned, and hanging up. He had found that both the children knew all about this chilly and smelly job. They'd learned that kind of thing on their great journey through giant land in the days of Prince Rillian. Then he'd tried to teach Eustace how to use his sword and shield. Eustace had learned quite a lot about sword fighting on his earlier adventures, but that had all been with a straight Narnian sword. He'd never handled a curved calamine scimitar, and that made it hard, for many of the strokes are quite different, and some of the habits he had learned with the long sword had now to be unlearned again. But Tyrion found that he had a good eye and was very quick on his feet. He was surprised at the strength of both the children. In fact, they both seemed to be already much stronger and bigger and more grown up than they had been when he first met them a few hours ago. It's one of the effects which Narnian air often has on visitors from our world. All three of them agreed that the very first thing they must do was go back to Stable Hill and try to rescue Jewel the Unicorn. After that, if they succeeded, they would try to get away eastward and meet the little army which Runewit the Centaur would be bringing from Caraparavel. 
An experienced warrior and huntsman like Tyrion can always wake up at the time he wants. So he gave himself till nine o'clock that night and then put all worries out of his head and fell asleep at once. It seemed only a moment later when he woke, but he knew by the light and the very feel of things that he had timed his sleep exactly. He got up, put on his helmet and turban, he'd slept in the mail shirt, and then shook the other two till they woke up. They looked, to tell the truth, very gray and dismal as they climbed out of their bunks, and there was a good deal of yawning. Now, said Tyrion, we go due north from here. By good fortune, tis a starry night, and it will be much shorter than our journeying this morning, for then we went round about, but now we shall go straight. If we are challenged, then do you two hold your peace, and I will do my best to talk like a cursed, cruel, proud lord of Calerman. If I draw my sword, then thou, Eustace, must do likewise, and let Jill leap behind us and stand with an arrow on the string. But if I cry home, then fly for the tower, both of you, and let none try to fight on, not even one stroke, after I've given the retreat. Such false valor has spoiled many notable plans in the wars. And now, friends, in the name of Aslan, let us go forward. Out they went into the cold night. All the great northern stars were burning above the treetops. The north star of that world is called the spearhead. It is brighter than our pole star. For a time, they could go straight towards the spearhead, but presently they came to a dense thicket so that they had to go out of their course to get around it. After that, for they were still overshadowed by branches, it was hard to pick up their bearings. It was Jill who set them right again. She had been an excellent guide in England. And, of course, she knew her Narnian stars perfectly, having traveled so much in the wild northern lands, and could work out the direction from other stars, even when the spearhead was hidden. As soon as Tyrion saw that she was the best pathfinder of the three of them, he put her in front. And then he was astonished to find out how silently and almost invisibly she glided on before them. "'By the main, he whispered to Eustace, "'this girl is a wondrous woodmaid. If she had Dryad's blood in her, she could scarce do it better.' She's so small, that's what helps, whispered Eustace. But Jill from in front said, Shh, less noise. All round them the wood was very quiet. Indeed, it was far too quiet. On an ordinary Narnian night there ought to have been noises. An occasional cheery good night from a hedgehog, the cry of an owl overhead, perhaps a flute in the distance to tell of fawns dancing, or some throbbing, hammering noises from dwarfs underground. All that was silenced. Gloom and fear reigned over Narnia. After a time, they began to go steeply uphill, and the trees grew further apart. Tyrion could dimly make out the well-known hilltop and the stable. Jill was now going with more and more caution. She kept on making signs to the others with her hand to do the same. Then she stopped dead still, and Tyrion saw her gradually sink down into the grass and disappear without a sound. A moment later, she rose again, put her mouth close to Tyrion's ear and said in the lowest possible whisper, Get down, see better. She said thee for see, not because she had a lisp, but because she knew that the hissing letter S is the part of a whisper most likely to be overheard. Tyrion at once lay down almost as silently as Jill, but not quite, for he was heavier and older. And once they were down, he saw how from that position you could see the edge of the hill sharp against the star-strewn sky. Two black shapes rose against it. One was the stable, and the other, a few feet in front of it, was a calamine sentry. He was keeping very ill watch, not walking or even standing, but sitting with his spear over his shoulder and his chin on his chest. Well done, said Tyrion to Jill. She had shown him exactly what he needed to know. They got up, and Tyrion now took the lead. Very slowly, hardly hardly daring to breathe, they made their way up to a little clump of trees, which was not more than forty feet away from the sentinel. "'Wait here until I come again,' he whispered to the other two. "'If I miscarry, fly.' Then he sauntered out boldly in full view of the enemy. The man started when he saw him and was just going to jump to his feet. He was afraid Tyrion might be one of his own officers and that he would get into trouble for sitting down. But before he could get up, Tyrion had dropped on one knee beside him, saying, Art thou a warrior of the Tisrocks? May he live forever? It cheers my heart to meet thee among all these beasts and devils of Narnians. Give me thy hand, friend. Before he well knew what was happening, the Calamine sentry found his right hand seized in a mighty grip. Next instant, someone was kneeling on his legs, and a dagger was pressed against his neck. One noise, and thou art dead, 
said Tyrion in his ear. Tell me where the unicorn is, and thou shalt live. Behind the stable, O oh my master, stammered the unfortunate man. Good. Rise up and lead me to him. As the man got up, the point of the dagger never left his neck. It only traveled round, cold and rather ticklish, as Tyrion got behind him and settled it at a convenient place under his ear. Trembling, he went around to the other back of the stable. Though it was dark, Tyrion could see the white shape of Jewel at once. Hush, he said. No, do not neigh. Yes, Jewel, it is I. Have a, how have they tied thee? Hobbled by all four legs and tied with a bridle to a ring in the stable wall, came Jewel's voice. Stand here, sentry, with your back to the wall. So, now, Jewel, set the point of your horn against this calamine's breast. With good will, sire, said Jewel. If he moves, rive him to the heart. Then in a few seconds, Tyrion cut the ropes. With the remains of them, he bound the sentry hand and foot. Finally, he made him open his mouth, stuffed it full of grass, and tied him up from scalp to chin so that he could make no noise, lowered the man into a sitting position, and set him against the wall. I have done thee some discourtesy, soldier, said Tyrion, but such was my need. If we meet again, I may happen to do thee a better turn. Now, Jewel, let us go softly. He put his left arm round the beast's neck and bent and kissed its nose, and both had great joy. Then they went back as quietly as possible to the place where he had left the children. It was darker in there under the trees, and he nearly ran into Eustace before he saw him. All's well, whispered Tyrion. A good night's work. Now for home. They turned and had gone a few paces when Eustace said, Where are you, Paul? There was no na answer. Is Jill on the other side of you, sire? he asked. What? said Tyrion. Is she not on the other side of you? It was a terrible moment. They dared not shout, but they whispered her name in the loudest whispers they could manage. There was no reply. Did she go from you while I was away? asked Tyrion. I didn't see or hear her go, said Eustace, but she could have gone without my knowing. She can be as quiet as a cat you've seen yourself. At that moment, a far-off drumbeat was heard. Jewel moved his ears forward. Dwarfs, he said. And treacherous dwarfs, enemy as likely as not, muttered Tyrion. And here comes something on hoofs, much nearer, said Jewel. The two humans and the unicorn stood dead still. There were now so many different things to worry about that they didn't know what to do. The noise of both came steadily nearer. And then, quite close to them, a voice whispered, Hello, are you all there? Thank heaven, it was Jill. Where the devil have you been to, said Eustace in a furious whisper, for he had been very frightened. In the stable, gasped Jill, but it was the sort of gasp you give when you're struggling with suppressed laughter. Oh, growled Eustace, you think it's funny, do you? Well, all I could say, have you got Jewel, sire, asked Jill. Yes, here he is. What is that beast with you? <laughs> That's him, said Jewel, but let's be off home before anyone wakes up. And again, there came little explosions of laughter. The others obeyed at once, for they had already lingered long enough in that dangerous place, and the dwarf drums seemed to have come a little nearer. It was only after they'd been walking south for, for several minutes that Eustace said, Got him? What do you mean? The false Aslan, said Jill. What? said Tyrion. Where have you been? What have you done? Well, sire, said Jewel, as soon as I saw that you'd got the sentry out of the way, I thought, hadn't I better have a look inside the stable and see what really is there? So I crawled along. It was as easy as anything to draw the bolt. Of course, it was pitch black inside and smelled like any other stable. Then I struck a light, and would you believe it? There's nothing at all there but this old donkey with a bundle of lion skin tied to his back. So I drew my knife and told him he'd have to come along with me. As a matter of fact, I needn't have threatened him with the knife at all. He was very fed up with the stable and quite ready to come. Weren't you, puzzled, dear? Great Scott, said Eustace. Well, I... I'm jiggered. I was jolly angry with you a moment ago, and I still think it was mean of you to sneak off without the rest of us. But I must admit, well, I mean to say, it was a perfectly gorgeous thing to do. If she were a boy, she'd have to be knighted, wouldn't she, sire? If she were a boy, said Tyrion, she'd be whipped for disobeying orders. And in the dark, no one could see whether he said this with a frown or a smile. Next minute, there was a sound of rasping metal. What are you doing, sire? asked Jewel sharply. Drawing my sword to smite off the head of the accursed ass, said Tyrion in a terrible voice. Stand clear, girl. Oh, don't, 
Please don't, said Joe. Really, you mustn't. It wasn't his fault. It was all the ape. He didn't know any better, and he's very sorry. He's a nice donkey. His name's Puzzle, and I've got my arms around his neck. Jill, said Tyrion, you are the bravest and most woodwise of all my subjects, but also the most malapert and disobedient. Well, let the ass live. What have you to say for yourself, ass? Me, sire? came the donkey's voice. I'm sure I'm very sorry if I've done wrong. The ape, said Aslan, wanted me to dress up like that, and I thought he'd know. I'm not clever like him. I only did what I was told. It wasn't any fun for me living in that stable. I don't even know what's been going on outside. He never let me out except for a minute or two at night. Some days they forgot to give me any water, too. Sire, said Jewel, those dwarfs are coming nearer and nearer. Do we want to meet them? Tyrion thought for a moment and then suddenly gave a great laugh out loud. Then he spoke, not this time, in a whisper. By the lion, he said, I am growing slow-witted. Meet them? Certainly we will meet them. We will meet anyone now. We have this ass to show them. Let them see the thing they feared and bowed to. We can show them the truth of the ape's vile plot. His secret's out, the tide's turned. Tomorrow we shall hang that ape on the highest tree in Narnia. No more whispering and skulking and disguises. Where are these honest dwarfs? We have good news for them. When you've been whispering for hours, the mere sound of anyone talking out loud has a wonderfully stirring effect. The whole party began talking and laughing. Even Puzzle lifted up his head and gave a grand aw ee aw a thing the ape hadn't allowed him to do for days. Then they sent off in the direction of the drumming. It grew steadily louder, and soon they could see torchlight as well. They came out on one of those rough roads, we should hardly call them roads at all in England, which ran through Lantern Waste. And there, marching sturdily along, were about thirty dwarfs, all with their little spades and mattocks over their shoulders. Two armed calamines led the column, and two more brought up the rear. Stay, thundered Tyrion as he stepped out on the road. Stay, soldiers. Whither do you lead these Narnian dwarfs, and by whose orders? And that's the end of chapter six.